Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope that everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names added to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names of the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those who are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Good afternoon, good morning church. Hope everyone is doing well and that you had a, an excellent Easter weekend. Um, hope you're staying saved and safe. Um, hopefully you listened to the pastor's message. It was such a great message this past weekend and I couldn't help but think about the whole controversy with these tennis shoes that are coming out that's got the 666 and everything on them and how the pastor talked about how the Lord, the word that Jesus destroyed the Satan. So those shoes are just fake shoes. There's nothing real about them anyway. So appreciate the Lord so much for all he's done. Um, I know you heard the pastor announce it this past Sunday. I hope you do and hope we're getting a little bit of excitement. Um, we're planning on having our first in-person service on the 25th of April and get it started back up. So I um, want everyone to be continue to remember that and to pray. Uh, actually also plan on starting up men's prayer service in May as well. Um, we will, uh, hopefully there should have been some new announcements. Uh, there will be new announcements on this message that's on the 11th. So make sure you'll be listening to those. Uh, we'll be having some things talking about everything that's going on, but we will probably be taking temperatures of people when they come here. Uh, we will be wearing masks and we'll have to be doing some distancing. Uh, may have some seating arrangements that we're going to ask everybody to do for right now until we see how many people are here and how many we can get in here. We've got to move some benches around. And just, um, just we want to get everything right so we're doing it right. We want to make sure that we get it done, we do it right, and make sure everybody's safe and we're abiding by the law, as the pastor said. Um, we're going to have one service at first, uh, try to get our feet wet on it. Um, see how everything goes, and then after a week, a couple of weeks or whatever, we'll probably be even opening up back, hopefully, to the Sunday school for the little kids, and then maybe going further from that. And see, again, testing it, see how everything goes, how everybody reacts, and how everybody's treating it, making sure they're doing the right thing. Uh, hopefully, we can get back into actually having both services. So continue to remember that, continue to be praying for that. This uh, afternoon, morning, we're uh, still on our lessons on the mercies of God. Uh, this morning's lesson, or this evening serve <laughs> lesson, I still say morning even after a year. Uh, lesson 5, April the 4th. Uh, the, the lesson title is When Fear and Joy Collide. The focus thought is, if we will press on through fear, joy will win in the end. Focus verse is Matthew 28, verse 8. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And then the lesson text is Matthew 28, 1 through 9. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become, became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as he went to tell his disciples, as, as they went to tell his disciples, excuse me, the ladies, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hell. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for all your mercy, God. We thank you for your grace and all the things that you've done for us, Lord, for watching over us, keeping us, guiding us, providing for us, Lord, protecting us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, so much, God. God, give you praise. God, give you glory. God, give you honor for everything that you've done for us, Lord. God, we thank you, Jesus, for just watching over us and keeping us, God. We just ask you to bless the service, bless my voice. God, bless the, uh, let the words be your words. Let it come from your heart, not my heart. God, let it come from your mind and not my mind, Lord Jesus. God, let it bless the people, God. Ask you, Lord Jesus, God, just to bless us. Help us to be ready to get back in the service, Lord. God, just uh, ask you to, to touch the governor a little, lighten up some restrictions, Lord, to be able to make it a little more comfortable in here if we could. But whatever it is, God, we're just going to do what we have to do to get back in church. God, bless the service. We thank you and give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Jesus. And ye may be seated. This week's lesson deals with fear, and I had taught a lesson uh, a few weeks ago from the old series about freedom over fear. And so this one is about fear as well, and it shows uh, what can be 
on the other side of fear when we're able to push through our fears to get to the promises of the Lord. And the lesson is set on the day of Jesus' resurrection. And, and we have little hope of truly imagining what those that had followed Jesus were feeling at the time uh, uh, after his death and those three days before the resurrection. Uh, to have been with Jesus during all of his ministry on earth and to have then been there and to watch him go through the things that he went through. And it revolves around the women. Um, when you read different ones, it's, it's Mary Magdalene was there and there was the other Mary and some say Salome and then some say there are others. So we don't know exactly how many were there, but uh, it revolves around these, th these women that were there. And we could easily take lessons and we could look at these women's lives and we could see the things that God had done and we could teach lessons on them and how God had, had blessed them and, and tried to understand, to come to an understanding of what he meant to each one of them. Um, but we don't have the time for that. But these ladies, these people that were coming to the, to, the, to the tomb that day, they were the miracles of Jesus while he was on earth. They had worked miracles in their life. Uh, Mary Magdalene had had seven demons cast out of her. And so no doubt this, she followed him because of the peace and because of the joy that replaced all the confusion and the confused emotions and harsh emotions that she had that the demons had probably caused in her. And so Jesus, no doubt, had, had performed many more miracles in these ladies' lives. And if nothing else, they had witnessed them and had seen them, if nothing else, again, if nothing else. So, and the only way we could possibly have an idea of what he meant to them was if we understand what he means to us. When we look at where we were at, when he brought, where he's brought us from, what he's done for us, for his blood, uh, for the salvation and the thoughts about where I could have been if it hadn't have been for Jesus, to have never felt his presence, to have never felt his spirit, to have never felt his love, to never have felt his mercies. And for these ladies, they had felt this. They had been able to physically touch Jesus. They had touched him. They had heard his voice. They had uh, uh, to hear his voice. They'd uh, seen him. And then all of a sudden he was gone. Their, their hope was gone. Their, their master was gone and their savior was gone. And, and so he meant so much to them. And it's hard for us again to understand what that was, but they physically had their, him there with him. And then he was gone. So you can imagine that they were basically an emotional train wreck. For these three days, you have to know that these people were an emotional train wreck. And then let's add on the top the fact that they actually witnessed the crucifixion. They actually saw it. We, we've seen reenactments of it. We've seen it on TV. Some of you may have seen the movies. But to have been there in real life, to, to see it, to, to smell it, to, to hear it, to actually taste the air that was there that day, to be able to smell the smells and to be able to, the vinegar that they gave him, to hear the cries. I, I've never seen a person die before. Before. I've never witnessed that. Uh, I've never seen someone tortured before. I've never heard someone cry out with their last breath. And then much less to be as close as these people were to Jesus and then to see all of this stuff happen to him. That's you got to start beginning to imagine how much he meant to them. And maybe since these were different times, maybe it was a, maybe a little less traumatic. They actually had seen public uh, uh, executions and people died in homes more because there wasn't the hospitals and medicines. And, but we can't imagine what, they're feel, what they were feeling at that time. I don't want to imagine. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to know what it is. But we can see that we can understand that it was probably pretty bad. Now, three days later, and the haze has kind of set in. You know, was this a dream? Was this real? Was all this really happening? You know, it's the things that we, we experience when something traumatic happens in our life, whether it's a death or whatever. And two or three days, you wake up and you're like, is this, is this real? You know, my life has changed forever, but is this really real? Is, it, is he really gone? Are we going to walk out one day and find him teaching there? Three days, and, and they finally get the nerve to go to the tomb, and, and they knew that it had been guarded by a bunch of Romans, and would they be allowed to see the body? Would they be allowed to anoint the body? Would they be chased off? Would they be allowed even to be there? Jesus had spoken about the temple being destroyed, and I think the pastor uh, preached on it a little bit on Sunday. Uh, Jesus had spoken about the temple being destroyed and that he would raise it up in three days. Had they made that connection? You know, I'm pretty sure that they had not, but was that in the back of their minds? Were they, were they going with a little bit of hope in their heart? Maybe in these three, this is the third day, maybe he's risen. And you have to doubt that because if, if they made the connection, you would have had 
to have thought the disciples would have made the, the connection as well, and they would have been there. Uh, these ladies were there for something else. They had only come to anoint the body with some spices that they had prepared. Uh, Mark 16 and 1 says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And it goes on to say that they had wondered amongst themselves who would roll the stone away from the door of the sepulcher? They were there to see the dead body of Jesus. That's what they, they were, as the pastor preached, they were seeking the dead among the dead. But the angel, we know what he said, You're, why seek ye the living among the dead? But they, they were expecting to see the dead body of Jesus Christ. And as they were walking, an earthquake shook the ground under their feet, similar to the earthquake that, that the world experienced when Jesus finally gave up the ghost as he died on the cross. And science explains earthquakes as the, the shifting of tectonic plates uh, from the inside of the earth. And when we hear of earthquakes, we don't really give it a whole lot of thought. But in a society that didn't know anything about tectonic plates, you got to think that when they have earthquakes, they begin to think the gods are, are angry at them or there's some kind of superstition because they didn't quite fully understand them. And for good reason, because this one was the power of God moving the very foundations of the earth when Christ rose from the dead. It shook, you know, he died and he gave up the ghost and it shook the earth. I can only imagine when he resurrected, it had to be a, a two, three, four times the, the strength on the Richter scale when he rose from the dead from that tomb as he was coming up out of hell and the earth beginning to shake. Matthew 28, 2 through 4 says, And behold, there was an earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. His countenance was, was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Well, there's your question about who was going to roll the stone back. All of a sudden, these ladies were, who's going to roll the stone back from us? And maybe they said a little prayer, Lord, please let somebody be there to help us roll this thing away. And so there was their answer. Here was an angel, a visitor from heaven, rolling back that stone and sitting just as pretty as he could please on top of it. To look on him was like looking on lightning. His clothes was white as snow. And the guards at the tomb, the soldiers, the keepers, these were men that were trained to do battle. These were men that were trained to be brave. They charged into the face of death. They ran into the battle. They didn't run away from it. And then here they stood, shaking, not from the earthquake, but shaking from fear and from what they saw. And the Bible said they became these dead men. They had no life in them. They were puppets that didn't have a string to pull to bring them to life. They'd not, these guys hadn't signed up for this. These guys had just simply signed up to keep a dead man in the grave. No big deal. That should have been pretty simple. Maybe his chicken disciples would, would find some nerve to come and do something, but they were pretty sure that they were weak and they were in hiding. They wouldn't do anything. So they thought they knew what to do in the face of fear, but they didn't know this kind of fear. They didn't know what this was because this was not a normal fear. This was a fear from God. Psalms 9 and 20 says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men, Salah. These soldiers were the best of the best, but now all of a sudden they realized that they wasn't nothing at all before the power of God, before just a simple angel of God had come down before them, and they were, thought they were something, and they were quickly reminded but they, that they were nothing but flesh and blood. And you may feel like you're tough today, and you might feel like I'll be able to stand and fight and handle whatever might come my way. Yeah, we got trouble sometimes, and, and you know everybody's talking to Mark of the Beast, and I'll be able to fight, but, but you know what? Uh, uh, you, we haven't even become the no what the last days. We don't even, the pastor talked about it on Sunday so much, we don't even know what tribulations is. We don't even know what hard, our country, uh, me personally, I know nothing about hard times. I know nothing about suffering. Uh, we, we may never see that kind of suffering. The Lord may come and get us, but if we do, we better have the Lord on our side. We better not be like these men and be all on our own. We better have the Lord. We better be trained by, not by the world to fight off fear. We better not have a, a, a few uh, psychologists uh, uh, up, visits up our sleeve. We better have the Holy Ghost. We better have the Spirit of God residing in ourselves. These soldiers did not know God and their reaction at see, seeing the angel showed that they did not know God. But then there were the ladies. <laughs> They knew God. Matthew 28, 5 through 6. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord laid. 
The angel read their mind. He was concerned with their thoughts. And they were Jesus' followers. They were Jesus' servants. And the soldiers, they were not. They, the angels didn't go to them. They didn't, say, didn't tell them guys don't fear. He went to the servants of God and said, don't you guys fear. The angel addressed the ladies and their feelings instead of the soldiers. So it's good to know the Savior. It's good to know the, it's good to know the Lord because when you're servant of the Lord, he's coming to talk to you. When everybody else, the rest of the world is shaking and, and standing like dead men, God is going to bring a message to you. He's going to bring a message of hope. He's going to bring a message that says, fear not to you. And he's going to leave the rest of the world. You're going to be like Paul. Paul saw the light and everybody else stood around him like, what in the world's going on? He's talking to somebody and we don't hear anything. What's, what's happening here? You'll be the one hearing the word of God. You'll be hearing the word of God saying, peace, trust, 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 trust. You'll be hearing that and the rest of the world will be deaf to it. There's, again, there, you'll, there'll be no reason. Again, uh, the angel knew that they were afraid, but he was letting them know. He was letting them know that there was no reason to fear anymore. There's no reason to be hopeless anymore. There's no reason to live in the confusion that you've had these past three days. He's not here. He, he's risen. He's, he's done gone out of here. That tomb was just the loners. We preached several, several months back. They had hopes of seeing the dead body of Jesus, but what they didn't see was a whole lot better. They had hopes of seeing the dead body of Christ, but what they did not see gave them a whole lot more hope than anything that they would have seen if he would have been there. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If all the hope that these three ladies had was seeing Jesus in that tomb, they would have been miserable. They would have been miserable. And it's the same for us. If all I have in this earth is I want to, I want to see a vision of Jesus. Oh, if I could just see the vision. If I could just see him. If I could just sit down and have Jesus come sit down beside me. If that's all I'm looking for, well, I'm going to be miserable. Uh, and, and, and they will be. But, but I don't care about seeing Jesus on this earth. I, I don't care if he never comes down and says, beside me and talks with me and puts his arm around me. I don't care. I want to see him up in heaven. That's the only place I'm really concerned about seeing Jesus. If I, can get, if I know I'm going to see him there, I can do without seeing him down here. I don't need no vision. I, I don't need no uh, dream. I don't need anything like that. I just need, I want to make sure that I see Jesus. I want to be lifted off this planet and be headed up to the place where he's gone to prepare for me. That's the only place I care. My hope is not seeing him in this world. My hope is seeing him up there. Come and see the place where he was laid at, the angel said. Come and see, and you'll see the stone rolled away. You see the guards, they've been here for days. They've been, we've had guards here off and on, you know, on the whole time, but different guards, night and day for three days. These guards, they, they, they were awestruck. They saw something that was awesome. They, they knew what was going on. Something had happened. Jesus' body is gone. It's not there. He's risen, just like he said it would. The spirit that had left the body when he gave up the ghost on that cross had now re-entered into him and had given life to that body again. Just being like being filled with the Holy Ghost, we get new life. We, this old dead body, when we repent and we bury it in baptism and it comes back up out of the water, we get the Holy Ghost. It fills us again with that life. He had the victory over everything that man was unable to defeat since creation death in the grave. Matthew 28, 7 through 8 says, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' words. You've seen that the Savior has risen now. You've seen that he is alive. Now go do your job. Go spread the gospel. You've seen... These, these women were the first spreaders of the gospel. They were the first ones to, 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 to give a message about... Jesus is alive. Jesus has resurrected. He is alive again. That was the charge that the angel gave, the, gave them, and that was the first ones, and that's the same charge that we've been given. Spread the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. Go tell the world that he is alive, that he died for sins, and that he rose again, and he has the keys to death and hell and, and death. All these things have been defeated. They were given, the ladies were given a new hope that he goes before you. He's not here. He's risen. They didn't come with any hope. They, the only hope that they had, had was that they were going to see the body of Jesus Christ and they would be able to anoint that dead body. But now they've been given a, a new hope. He's risen. He's gone before you. He's already waiting on you where you're going. You're going to see him when you go there. And if you love Jesus and you keep this commandment that what I'm telling you, go, you're going to be there. He's already ahead of you. Uh, the angel said, I I've told you this. Write it down. Mark it 
in the book, take it to the bank. This thing is going to happen. He's alive, and there he is. And so you can imagine the hope that these ladies were now stu- struck with. They came here to see, again, the dead body, but he, they didn't see that. What they didn't see was, again, much, much better than what they could have seen. And even better, more importantly, they now had the hope, we're going to see him again. Not only are we going to see the dead body, we're going to see him alive. He has risen again. They had hope. They had a promise. He's just ahead of you. All he's already, uh, You just have to go, as I told you, keep pushing ahead, the angel said. Follow the com- commandments and don't let the fear swallow you up. Be not afraid. Then you'll see him. And it said they departed quickly, still with the fear. They had the fear, but then they also had great joy as well. They had fear, but they had joy as well. Fear of the unknown. Was this real? Was this a ghost? Will we really see him again? Is this just a trick of our minds? What will the others say when we tell them? Will they laugh at us? Will they mark and mock? Will they scorn us? And as the pastor had preached on Sunday, we see that they really didn't believe him. So they had real fear. These ladies had some fear in them. You can imagine you saw an angel. They had fear inside of them. They had the same fear. Uh, they had the same fear that the disciples had that when they had saw the ghost of Christ walking on the water when the water was troubled. And fear is a strange thing. And we saw what it did to the soldiers there guarding at the tomb. Uh, it caused them to be as dead men. They weren't able to move. But their fear was alone. It, they had nothing else to go with it. They had nothing to defeat this fear. They had no hope to go along with it. Proverbs 29 and 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. It brings a snare. These guys were caught in a snare. They were unable to to move. They were unable to respond. They were like dead men. And then it goes on to say, but whosoever put us his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The, the name of the Lord is what? It's a mighty strong tower and the righteous run in and they are safe. They are safe. The fear of man, the fear that comes from being human, it has no hope. It stands alone and it leaves you standing and sitting or laying down, crying, worried, alone, not being able to move. But then on the other hand, Proverbs 19 and 23 says that the fear of the Lord tendeth to life. The fear of the Lord takes care of life. It, like it tends to a garden or, or to a rose bush. It, it cares for it. The fear, having fear of the Lord inside of you, it tends to life. It cares for life. It watches over it. And it said, those that fear the Lord shall abide. He that, he that hath it shall abide satisfied and shall not be visited with Evil, these, those people that have the fear of the Lord, your life is going to be tended to by the Lord and you're going to be satisfied and know that evil will not, uh, evil will not visit you. The fear of the Lord is not alone. When you had the fear of man, when you just had the fear of the world, you've got nothing else with you. All you've got is that fear, and it just locks you up. You've got nothing to defeat you. But when you had the fear of God, it comes along with some promises. The fear of the Lord comes along. It comes along with many, many promises. And, and we can go through the Bible, and we can list a bunch of them. But here's three just in this verse alone. You can, you can, uh, your life will be tended to. It will be cared to by the Lord. You'll be satisfied. And then, then evil will not come upon you. Just take the satisfaction action part. Think about being satisfied. Are you satisfied today? Any of you guys satisfied today with everything you got and you don't want anything and there's nothing in this world that you want and you have no desire to get anything else? Crickets. It was kind of crickets sounding there. You know, but if, if you don't have that, then you have to check your fear and the reverence of the Lord you have. When we've got the fear of God in us, we're supposed to be satisfied with everything God has given us and not really have the desires of this world and to want and want another car and want another house and want another boat and want to go build this and go build that and go here and go there. I'm supposed to be satisfied with everything that God has given us. We have to have the fear of the Lord, the fear of the world. If we, if we don't have the fear of the Lord, then the fear of the world can creep in to our lives when we're so connected to this world and we're connected to our stuff and we're connected to the things that we want and the things that we desire, then the fear of losing those things and the fear of having those things taken away can, can change us. It can change how we react to things. It, you know, even, even if we fear losing our family, fear losing our lives, it can cause us to, it, to, to change. It can cause us to stand still and be locked up. But the fear of the Lord makes us 
satisfied. It makes us satisfied with what we have. And we've got to have the fear of the Lord. We can experience the hope that lies when we have the fear of the Lord. We can experience the hope that lies in the Lord. We know that there's more to this life than just living. There's more to this life than just dying and working and gathering and cleaning houses and cars and taking care of property and stuff and paying taxes on all the stuff that we get. There's more than just trying to, as the song says, just trying to make it through the day. We're living for that great day. That's the day we need to be focused on living for. I'm looking for that great day. And that's the hope. We have the hope that even if we have fear inside of us, these ladies had something that goes along. They had the fear of the Lord. And even though they had fear, they had the same fear that those disciples had. They had fear, the same type of fear that those, that those soldiers had. Even though they had that, they had the hope that goes along with it that we're going to go see Jesus. We're going, to go, we're going to go see Jesus. That's what they had their minds on. And, and when they had that hope in, inside of them, it was able to help them to be able to push along. They didn't just have hope. They had hope with the joy. They had hope with, with, with they, they didn't just have fear, excuse me. They didn't just have fear, but they had the fear with the hope. And they had the hope, that hope brought the joy. It brought the joy with them. So when they left, it said that they had hope. And they left with joy. And God had said that Jesus had already gone on before them, knowing that the Lord had already walked the road for them, that he had already gone in there. And the joy of the Lord is, is our strength. And, and they go through the, the world knowing that, that, that Jesus has already gone on. They, he's already walked that road for them. He's already lay up ahead waiting in them. That joy, that trust that they had come to possess by knowing Jesus. That's where that hope came from. That's where that joy came from. It was from having the relationship relationship of knowing him, of being a servant, loving him and keeping his commandments, carry them through their fears. It pushed them past their fears. It's what gave them the strength and that joy was realized before they even got to where they were going. They had the hope and the joy of going to see Jesus, but before they got there, possibly it doesn't say it, but maybe you can actually think maybe their fear was beginning to overcome them. Maybe their fear was getting to be too much. And before they got there, Jesus met them. Matthew 28, 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hell. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. They didn't have to wait until they got to the end of the road to be in his presence. They, he met them. He saw them. He saw their fear and he wanted to calm their fear. He wanted to be there with them. That was a, that's a great thing about God. Now he was back on earth and he said, I, I'm there to calm your fears. I'm there to give you peace. I'm there to take that joy and, and give you joy everlasting. He came to them and then when he got there, all the fear was gone. Every bit, they forgot about the fear. The joy of seeing Jesus there, the joy of seeing him made the fear disappear and they forgot about it. They didn't even know what it felt like because they were basking in the presence of Jesus Christ. Is he really alive? Is this a hoax? Oh yeah, they, got, they went down and they grabbed him by the feet and they began to, to worship him. Yes, they are. Yes, he is. He's alive and he's here so that we can worship him. They were once again in the presence of the Lord and it was all because they didn't allow their fears to ensnare them. When I read the culture connection, it was talking about the fear of having a baby and when the joy came that would come once the baby was born. And I couldn't help but think about the little baby that Jonathan had requested prayer for this past Sunday. I think he said he was maybe one year old and was having a play date with Jared and Anna and Miles. And he was born with a condition that would, I think it was, he wouldn't allow his muscles to ever develop. And you can see as a parent, as a soon-to-be parent, you have those fears while you and your spouse are expecting and waiting for the baby and, and, and what, what's, you know, is it going to be okay? We're going to have 10 fingers and 10 toes. Brenda miscarried twice, and so we had the fear if she would ever be able to have children at all. You might have fear, again, of the health and the condition of the child, but once the child is born and you get to see that the child is perfectly healthy and all those fears go away and you don't even forget, you don't even think about those fears anymore. You find out that it was all unfounded fear and that you spent all this time worrying for absolutely nothing. But then I thought about those parents and of that child that Jared, Jared and Anna had met and those fears that they may have had about their child and how those, some of those fears came true with their loved one. 
but I have to imagine that the joy that they had from, from holding that child the first time, uh, seeing their face, and Devin uh, just had her baby, and I, I go back and think about that, the joy of when we had our children, Heather and Nicholas, the joy of seeing them for the first time and seeing their face and their little tiny hands wrapping around the finger and, and hearing them cry, and, and all of a sudden, all the fears and all the things, and even if there was something wrong with them, just holding them in your hand, despite found in all this out, all of the joy that you would have to have of having them there in your presence, uh, that, that would, you would forget all these things. And, and then you think about all the milestones that a child would reach and it just you look forward to those days. And what if you had known ahead of time that the child would have these types of issues and you were given the opportunity to decide to keep the child or to give, up, give it up for adoption or even to abort the child? It'd be easy to allow fear to direct you into a decision of where you wouldn't want to keep the child. Fear of the unknown. You know, you know that there's a problem, there's something up ahead. What's it going to be like? How bad is this disability going to be? How, how much care is it going to be? How much is it going to cost? How, many time, how much of my time as, a, a, as selfish human beings we can be, how much of my time is, is this going to take in caring for the child? How's it, going to re, how's it going to affect the relationship with my spouse? And if you were to give into the fear, the joy that, that would be reached with having that child, of holding that child, of experience each milestone in that child's life would never be met. You'd never see it. You'd never experience the joy of the, the little hand grabbing uh, the little hand grabbing a hold of the finger. That the joy, the place where joy <laughs> and fear meets, and joy is wiped away, or the fear is wiped away because of the joy. You no longer remember that time. In in our lives, there are times when we have we have moments of fear. We have great fear in our lives, and many of us have experienced a lot of fear in this past year. But we can't allow. Fear to paralyze us like it did those guards at Jesus' tomb. The angel came, and when they saw him, they were so struck with fear, they were as dead men. These were men that were trained to react. These were men that were trained to go to rush headfirst into battle, to put their lives, to give up their lives for a reason. They couldn't even react if they had wanted to. These ladies were struck with the same fear when they saw him at first, but then they had something more powerful than fear. They had the hope. They had the hope of seeing Jesus Christ. They had the hope that would help drive them into obeying what the angel had requested them to, say, to, to do. Go forward. Just hearing the words, I, I know you seek Jesus. He's not here. He's risen. Go. He's gone before you. You're going to see him. That gave rise to their hope, and it activated their joy. We can't allow the fears that we experience in this world to stop us from moving forward with our walk with Christ. Our feet can't be so firmly planted in this world that we lose our hope in seeing Jesus when fear hits us and we lock up and we're worried about losing this. And we're, Because I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a time when we may lose these things whenever if, if the world tarries who knows what's going to happen you may lose the car they may come take the house they may take well, I don't know what it might be for whatever reason it might be and you may lose these things and are you going to have fear that you're unable to react that you're, you're not looking forward to Jesus you're more looking forward to ha keeping your car and keeping these things we, we can't have our eyes on these things on everything that's going on around us we got to keep our eyes on Jesus we got to keep it on the Lord when Peter stopped, stepped out of the boat he stepped out on faith and he was going to walk with Jesus. He was walking on the water. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to look around him and saw the water rolling and the wind blowing and heard the waves and heard everything, he saw all the things that was going on around him. He Fears began to conquer his faith and it began to conquer the hope and began to conquer the joy that he had. And he began to sink. Luckily for him... <laughs> There was one he was going to meet that came to meet him. <laughs> there was one that was coming that, that he was going to go meet. He was going to, but then all of a sudden Jesus came to him. Just like those ladies, Jesus, met, and it came to the time when his fear began. He, was, he had stepped out on faith. I'm going to walk and I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going to go to him. And then all of a sudden the fear began to overcome him and he began to think, Jesus, just like he came to those ladies, he came to Peter and took him by the hand and he walked him the rest of the way to that boat. It's uh, what 
what a promise that we have, what a, uh, the rock that we have, to have our feet set on the rock, that, uh, the foundation of Jesus Christ, that whatever happens, even if we have fear in our lives and, and if we're trusting in Him and we're going to go see Him, we're on the road to go see Him, and if fear begins to conquer us, He's going to meet us. He's going to meet us and He's going to wipe all that fear away because the joy of seeing Jesus in our life, the joy of feeling the presence of God, of being able to worship Him just like getting ready to be coming back into the house of God. I'm, I'm filled with anticipation to be able to be with the people of God, to be in the house of God, to be able to worship Him again. I know we can do it at home, but there's something special about being in the presence of God, being in the house of God with the people of God. He's gone on, uh, the people of God. He's gone on before us. He's scoped the road out that we've traveled, and He's already walked it, and He's made it to the end, and He's got a place prepared for us that we're going to go see Him. And like the ladies, we just have to obey. We've got to walk the road, even when we have the fear, knowing that even though we have fear in us, but the fear, the joy that we should have, knowing that the hope that we're going to see him. And if need be, he'll meet us on the road again where we're at if we need to, to ease our doubts and our fears. The book talked about FDR's inaugural address in 1932, where he famously, famously, famously said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear can, can drop us dead in our tracks and have us worrying about things that may never happen. Fearing things that might happen, even fearing things that might happen, but we don't have any control over them. It'll stop us from pushing through and reaching the joy that waits just on the other side of that. A joy that's so powerful that it has the ability to wash away all those fears. The memories, the, the, the having those fears, uh, the, uh, of, uh, going, going back to everything that happened back during Christmas and with COVID and worried about mom. I don't even remember what it felt like anymore. Just from the joy of knowing that she, everything's okay, she's okay, we're all okay. And the fear didn't, I, I wasn't worried about myself again. I was just worried about mom. But I don't even have that anymore. I don't even remember that. Weeping may endure through the night. Fear may endure through the night. But joy is just on the other side. It comes in the morning, and I promise you that. We don't know the future, but I can tell you there's going to be times coming in the future that you're going to have fear in your life. Fear for your life. Fear of death. Fear of what things might happen. But Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, with according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again into a lively hope. He's begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection. And going back to the resurrection as a pastor priest, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has given us a lively hope that we know that we are going to go see him one day. We're on the road. I want to be on that road that I'm going. he's gone before us. He's walked the path. He's already done it. And I've got hope. I may run into some fears, um, but it's not going to stop me. I'm going to stay on the road. I'm going to stay on the road pushing him. I'm going to have the joy of the Lord in my life. I'm going to have the hope that I'm going to see him. But if the fears get to be too much, I know I've got the, tr I know I've got the promise that he's going to come and he's going to take me by the hand and he's going to walk us all the rest of the way we have to. Those three women, they were afraid, afraid of what they saw, afraid of what they might see, afraid of what they might not see. But they pushed through their fears and they had the hope, a hope that was realized. The joy washed away, again, all the fears that they had entered into their hearts and their minds. Don't allow fear. Don't allow the fear that you feel in this world to hold you connected to this world. Unable to move for God. Get, separate yourself from it if you have to. Get away from this junk because all it will be, it'll, you'll be afraid of losing this, you'll be afraid of losing, losing that. Get your eyes on Jesus. Push through and experience the joy that lays on the other side. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. God, we thank you for the grace. All that you've done for always watching over us, for keeping us, guiding us, blessing us, protecting us. God, thank you for the hope that we have and for the joy that we can have in our life. Looking forward to that great day when we see Jesus Christ, when we see you, Lord, up in heaven, when you, the trumpet sounds, and that's the day we're looking for, God. That's, that, that's what we got to live our lives for. I'm living my life for that one day, God. I'm living my life for that one day, God, that one chance. That we got one chance, we got one opportunity. God, that's what I'm living my life for, that one chance and that opportunity to make it to heaven, Lord, when the trumpet, I, I may not live to that day, I may be in the grave, but I want to be ready when I hit that grave, Lord. Lord Jesus, God, let us, God, let us push through the fears that's in this life, God, and God, take the joy and take the hope that's with us, God, let it help us push through these fears, God, so that we can see that hope and we can, yeah. through our hope, we can see the joy, that receive the joy that will be with spend eternity with you, Lord. Give you praise and glory and honor for Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you so much.
Church, we love you. We pre- we looking forward to being able to be back in church again. Remember, there'll be a message this Sunday. And remember to con- watch, listen for the announcements. I know we've been playing the same announcements for, for many weeks, months. Uh, but there will be some announcements. So begin, if you can, to start listening to those again. God bless. Take care. Uh, hope to see you soon.